Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. W. W. Phelps was instrumental in helping translate the Book of Abraham. But of course we know that what's on those Egyptian papyrus and what's in the Book of Abraham are not the same. How do Mormon scholars handle this? It turns out that there's a bit of a civil war in the role of W. W. Phelps in this whole matter. So we're going to talk about this civil war with Dr. Bruce Van Orden. He's the biographer of W. W. Phelps' book, uh, We'll Sing and We'll Shout, The Life and Times of W. W. Phelps. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. You mentioned Egyptian. Uh, what was Phelps' involvement with the Book of Abraham? <laughs> That's a huge story, and there's a whole chapter involved in it. <laughs> Let me just say this. <clears throat> That the existing uh, Kirtland Egyptian papers, they call it, the whole splash of them, are now in a volume of the Joseph Smith papers reproduced. And uh, a whole bunch of them are in the handwriting of Phelps. It looks like Phelps and Cowdery and to a small extent Joseph Smith came up with the Egyptian alphabet where they gave an interpretation of some of the Egyptian signs into English. Some people put that entirely into Phelps and I think that Phelps had everything to do with it all right. Uh, how much of that was used in the uh, put together of the Book of Abraham is all speculation. But most of us, including some of the people put together that Joseph Smith papers volume on the book of Abraham, believe that all that Joseph Smith got on the book of Abraham in Kirtland was Abraham chapter 1 up through Abraham chapter 2 verse 18. And then chapter 2 verse 19 through the end is what he dictated in Nauvoo. And he published both of them. Uh, in separate places in the Times and Seasons after he became the official editor and, uh, and Phelps helped him put it out in the Times and Seasons because he was his main man in the Times and Seasons. Uh, I've gone as far as to say, but not authoritatively, that I believe that the last half of the Book of Abraham is a combination of Joseph Smith and Phelps. It has a lot of the Hebrew isms in there. And remember that Phelps knew Hebrew better than Joseph Smith. And uh, uh, I think he helped him put it, it together in the language in which it exists today. And then the very first part of Abraham, Abraham 1, 1 through 3, is in the handwriting of Phelps. And I believe he had a hand in the language there too. I don't know. One thing we do know is that after Joseph Smith passed away, Phelps, almost entirely by himself, taught these doctrines that were in the book of Abraham about Kolob and, and, uh, and the multiple worlds and the multiple gods and all of these things in the times and seasons after Joseph Smith died and then on into Utah. And he wrote that song or poetry, if you could hide a Kolob in a twinkling of an eye, that's what he wrote to Brigham Young, and it was published in the Desert News, and that's all based on the Book of Abraham. And I believe that F Phelps loved what came out of the, the Book of Abraham and promoted it like nobody else, including that special song, If You Could Hide a Cola. So that we can thank F Phelps for that. Okay. Um, do you have any, it seems like in the, in the church there's a little bit of a civil war on the, on the book of Abraham. Oh, there's a major warfare on that. <laughs> <clears throat> can, can you weigh in on that? Uh, Maybe explain both sides a little uh, bit? Yeah, uh, well, one side is that uh, Joseph Smith thought he was actually translating right straight from the uh, papyri that he had in his hands. <clears throat> he believed, and I believe that he believed that he was doing that. <clears throat> I don't know. We don't, we don't have all the details. We only have little smatterings of comments by him and Joseph uh, Phelps and Oliver Cowdery. Um, if we consider it prophetic, the book of Abraham, there are two possibilities. One, that uh, there were other papyri that have not come back to light, that were lost or burned, uh, that did contain the actual writings of Abraham, and he used that to translate from, 
into our book of Abraham. I don't believe it, but some people believe it. Mm -hmm. The other one is that uh, he got so caught up in this, this was a catalyst, and he received inspiration, the mind and will of God, by the gift and power of God, as we came forth to the Book of Mormon. Uh, we now know that most of the Book of Mormon was a translation, purportedly, from the plates, but he didn't use the plates to translate or dictate. He used the seer stone in his hat. Uh, and, and so uh, he wasn't using the plates to read and get the English. Well, the same kind of thing could have happened here. And remember that the uh, first part of the book of Moses is actually a vision of Moses that isn't found in Genesis. This is something that he received by revelation uh, and dictated. And by the gift and power of God, we might assert. And the same thing then about the book of Abraham. I believe in the catalyst doctrine that uh, the, his work with these Egyptian manuscripts prompted him to seek God's will as to what Abraham would have written. And, and he came forth with this, these five chapters, which I believe is prophetic for the most part. <clears throat> but uh, the opposite point of view is that this is just his writing that he thought came from Abraham. Okay, so the book of Abraham is more revelatory than an actual translation from Egypt. Well, it certainly is not a translation of the existing Joseph Smith papyri that uh, we have in our hands that were discovered, rediscovered in the 1960s mm -hmm. and sold to the church in 1967 from the New York Museum of Art. Uh, we have those 12 pieces, and they don't show the book of Abraham. They're from the book of breathings, the book of the dead. Right. We know that. Okay. So, um, so it sounds like, because I know we talked a little bit about the Civil War, it seems like there's kind of the Carrie Milstein, John Gee camp that basically say there's some missing papyrus and that's the real book of Abraham. I would say that Carrie Milstein is not quite as firm on that. He says it's a possibility. John Gee is really strong on the fact that they're probably, he, he's not 100% sure either, <clears throat> but you, excuse me, <clears throat> John Gee <clears throat> does believe <clears throat> that there were other papyri. Okay. And then you have uh, kind of the more Robin Jensen, Dan Vogel, Brian Hauglid that are kind of more of the catalyst theory. Is that well, uh, fair? Uh, ha ha Hauglid and, uh, and Robin Jensen, yes. I'm with them. Uh, uh, Dan Vogel, of course, believes that Joseph Smith wasn't a prophet in the first place, uh, really, from God, that he, he concocted this based on what he thought was he was coming up with the Egyptian alphabet and so forth. So as far as the Egyptian alphabet, because I think that's, there's, a, there's a big issue on the timeline there. If I remember right, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Milstein, Guy basically say these Egyptian characters were just like an outline and the trans and that's not really a translation. That's what they believe and I actually agree with them. Oh, you do? On that. That, uh, that Joseph Smith dictated the verbiage that's uh, more or less in the book of Abraham now. Uh, and I believe it came from God. Uh, it was inspired. I don't say that every word was written by Abraham ever, but I believe it's inspired writing. And, uh, uh, and the Egyptian alphabet was more of a side project. I, oh. I, I, do be I agree with uh, that. Okay, because I think Vogel says... No, this is the Egyptian character, and this is supposed to be the translation. Except it, it really isn't, except for what he thinks is in uh, Abraham 1, 1 through 3. And I think that Phelps put that in there. Think He thought it was that. I don't think that Joseph Smith thought that, that was that. Uh, we don't know. Yeah. So, but, but that's only three verses. So you think the first three verses of the book of Abraham are, are Phelps' translation? It's in his handwriting. I don't think it's necessarily a Phelps translation, but once he, once it was put in there, I feel that he th thought that this project that he was working on, and that Joseph Smith may have participated on to a certain extent, the Egyptian alphabet was different from the translation experience, I think, and then Phelps superimposed what he thought was from the Egyptian uh, figurine, figures, hieroglyphics, to those first three verses. We don't have any other evidence that there's a connection specifically. Okay. Uh, of course, there's the hypocephali that right. uh, are uh, 
we don't know who put that together <laughs> exactly, but probably was Joseph Smith, and, and uh, thinking and believing that those figures there taught this, this, and this. But uh, they are actually part of the Book of Breathings, and they, and I guess it could be an interpretation, but it's it's not a direct translation of the Egyptian, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of mystery, and you're right; it's a war, and it's a, and, and a, a means for discussion. And of course, I would say one of the biggest single things that undercuts people's faith and leads to faith crises because it, it it's hard to show the exact connection between Joseph Smith's work on these papyri and that this is the, the writings of Abraham anciently. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Bruce Van Orden. Our next conversation with Bruce is going to be our last, so if you haven't signed up to our free newsletter at gospeltangents.com newsletter, sign up today so I can send you the secret link. People who receive the newsletter will find out who the church turned to to get the printing press in Salt Lake City. When the Saints were on the way west in winter quarters, Phelps was assigned to go get a press because they needed a new press. And he went and got it in Boston, and that was the press that was used for all of the publications in Salt Lake, including the Deseret News and the Deseret Almanac, and Phelps single-handedly put out the Almanac for 15 years in Salt Lake. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe for just $5 a month at patreon.com slash gospel tangents, and you can hear the entire interview before everybody else. If you'd like to watch the entire video for just $8 a month, you can either subscribe on YouTube, Patreon, or my website, gospeltangents.com. Just look, click the yellow subscribe button, and I'll add you to our Gospel Tangents Insiders group so that you can see entire videos. For those interested in a PDF transcript, you can subscribe at either Patreon or on my website. For just $10 a month, I'll send you a PDF as soon as it's complete. If you'd like a copy of the paperback as well as a PDF, just sign up for $20 a month at either Patreon or my website, gospeltangents.com. Of course, you can buy individual transcripts at amazon.com and just do a search for Gospel Tangents interview and you can see all the things that we have there. Don't forget to support Gospel Tangents with an awesome t-shirt like one of these. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. Get our latest updates at facebook.com slash gospeltangents. Also, you can get our Twitter updates at gospeltangents. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.